there's a common misconception that the scientific pursuit is pure objectivity. Um, particularly when it comes to doing science to investigate things you cannot see. I do that every day. Um, and we even joke around about how when we uh, isolate RNA or protein, we expect to see something at the bottom of the tube, and often we don't. We, we walk by faith and not by sight. <laughs> but more seriously, there's a diverse uh, kinds of scientists in the life that I'm more familiar with um, that are investigating things that you cannot directly observe. Right? How deep is the ocean floor? Right? Uh, what are the mechanisms of speciation uh, you know, X billion years ago? These are clearly not things that we can directly observe. And so what is it that we're doing as scientists? We are making observations and you're generating hypotheses, doing tests, making observations, all the classical things. But fundamentally what we're doing is accumulating evidence in favor of one model or the other. And so when we sit down to try to uncover a particular biological phenomenon or answer a biological question, there are any number of models that might explain that. Right? And our job is to, in a rigorous manner, with a careful logic, evidence that either supports or refutes one model over another. And so the reason why, for example, that the vast majority of biologists subscribe to the evolutionary theory is not because in the purest sense of the world, word anybody has gone back in history and proven it and shown the tape of history to everybody and said, well, here it is. It's actually just the inferences that have been made over many years. In fact, when Darwin came out with his origin of species, there was a tremendous amount of skepticism in the scientific community. And in fact, it was actually Asa Gray, a theologian at Princeton University, who encouraged Darwin's ideas uh, in America and how much times have changed. Right? But over the years um, is the development of evidence um, that eventually uh, suggested that that model that was far more plausible, enormously more plausible, than really any other model that we might invoke, right? And that's a lot of the times what we're doing in our scientific research. And so I think it is important that we are careful in thinking that science is pure objectivity and everything else is just subjective, right? We're not necessarily proving anything the way that you might in theoretical mathematics, right? It often feels like a proof because it's extremely convincing, um, but it's not technically a proof, right? Yeah. Um, so I think it is important to make that point. The second thing I would mention is that, um, and Roald has written uh, elegantly about this, there are other ways of knowing. Uh, that is uh, something that I believe. Uh, for example, consider the love that my wife has for me. If any one of you challenged me to prove it, mm -hmm. I'm not sure what I would do, uh, because I don't really think I could. I mean, I would sit there and say, well, look, I mean, consider our life and look at what she has done for me here and there and here's our story. But I would essentially be telling you a story and I would be relaying a set of experiences to you, right? That would either be convincing or not, right? But I wouldn't be able to prove it. And yet I don't know that any one of you would challenge me that I don't really know that my wife loves me, right? So there are different kinds of ways of knowing. And so even as a scientist, as I pursue reason and logic, I'm well aware the entire time that there are other ways of knowing and other ways of uh, shaping my identity. Even in uh, two hard sciences like chemistry and physics, the ways of knowing are different. And the ways of knowing in chemistry, or the most interesting part of what chemistry is, is not reducible to physics. That's not a necessarily a popular view among the physicists. Um, <laughs> But, and even among some chemists who are willing to accept reductionism, which is when it comes vis-a-vis -vis biology, but then they maybe draw a line of physics. Uh, I think what Praveen has said is right. We, uh, very little of science operates in a strictly scientific process of gathering evidence, forming hypotheses, and disproving them. 
a lot is stepwise accumulation of knowledge, just like he said, a kind of knowing without seeing. In the particular context of chemistry, the structures of all these molecules, uh, we did not wait for any microscopes. There's scanning, tunneling, microscopy, which can show us these images. We did not wait for any microscopes uh, to show us this, but with the uh, hard and soft knowledge of our minds and hands combined, there have to be experiments, with our fallible senses, with the extension of our senses that instruments are that have to be calibrated. Somehow we got little pieces of indirect knowledge that there was a double bond between the carbons in this mm. molecule and then that we could build from that a knowledge so that we could tell whether this molecule of chlorophyll or morphine was the way that it is. And that indirect knowledge needs to be admired uh, and it is very important. Can it, can, nevertheless, there is a scientific frame of mind, a way of looking at phenomena, which even the disparate fields of chemistry and physics and others that we share, we somehow have a feeling it has to do with the marshalling of the evidence, the kind of questions that you ask, and nothing is proven definitely, what is, but somehow a structure builds. Can one, can one apply that way of thinking to questions that are questions of faith? So part of it you can, and when Praveen talks, for instance, as I've heard him talk, about the historical evidence for the existence of Christ. Uh, he will, uh, or the resurrection, he will, part of it, he will marshal a quasi-scientific way of approaching that historical evidence. And the historicity question, yes, but then on other questions, I think you would, you, you take a leap of faith. Completely correct. Yes, there's only so far in certain kinds of knowing. I mean, again, going back to uh, the love that my wife has for me. She didn't know she was going to feature so prominently in yes. today's discussions. <laughs> um, but, uh, you, you know, if we're honest with ourselves. There is a little bit of, this isn't a perfect analogy, but there's a little bit of accumulation of evidence. You know, when you're dating, according, you're, you're looking for the signs or whether there is the evidence that this person is interested in you, that kind of thing. But at some point, a leap of faith that this is going to work. Um, as I said, this is not a perfect analogy, but this is in a lot of ways um, how my own journey and my, my spiritual journey was. Um, you know, I, I had an impulse even at an early age to want to be as rigorous uh, in my investigation of things as I could. And, you know, Paul himself says that if the resurrection is not real, then Christians are to be pitied among all people, because it's a royal waste of time. Um, everything hinges on that, right? And so if that is indeed the case, which I believe, then I darn well better do some due diligence to see whether this, there is feasibility here, right? And so there is, as Roald said, a quasi-scientific approach. And again, really for me, that just meant there are a lot of different models to explain what I'm sitting here reading in the Bible, anywhere from this was real, and that's why I'm reading it, to this is legend, fabrication, you know, uh, the greatest story ever told, and that's it, right? And then all sorts of, you know, <laughs> the possibilities in between. And so I have to look at those models and begin to uh, look at the evidences that I can in as much as is available to me from biblical and extra-biblical documentation and begin to build a case for one or the other models. But at some point, one has to take a leap of faith. And reason alone is not going to, uh, to bring you to the place where you say, aha, I've proven it to myself. It is, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, the scientific process is necessarily agnostic with respect to God in the sense that it can neither definitively prove or disprove his existence or any particular faith tradition.